Welcome to our podcast series of Coffee with Accord, where we discuss various peace and security related topics, including ongoing and emerging conflicts in Africa, policy developments, evolving theories, and innovative approaches to peace and security. Our guests are conflict resolution practitioners, experienced mediators, and policymakers within the peace and security landscape. Enjoy this episode and feel free to leave your comments. Coffee with Accord is published by the African Center for the Constructive Resolution of Disputes. The views and opinions expressed in this production do not reflect the views of Accord and its affiliates. And a warm welcome to Coffee with Accord. My name is Zoe Mafoko and I am your host for today. All the way from Monrovia, Liberia, today's guest is Mr. Edward Mulba, and we will be speaking to him about his work as the National Executive Director for the Liberia Peace Building Office, which falls within the Liberian Ministry of Internal Affairs. Before we get into that, please do feel free to grab yourself a cup of coffee, sit back, relax, and enjoy the short animated inserts, uh, which will hopefully contextualize the conversation we'll be having today. Stay with us. It gave you a little bit um, of a clue about what we're going to be chatting about today. But our very special guest is here, all the way from Monrovia, Liberia. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Edward Mulba, for joining us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. So I'm going to start us off easy, Mr. Mulba. Um, please just tell us a little bit about yourself and reflect on your experience in peace building and conflict prevention. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Zoe, for this uh, interview. Uh, currently, I serve as the the National Executive Director of the Liberia Peace Building Office, located at the Ministry of Internal Affairs. Uh, I'm responsible for the overall management and supervision of the Liberia Peace Building Office. I provide advice to the government on issues related to peace building reconciliation in the country. And of course, uh, prior to this position, I served as the as a senior technical advisor to the Peace Building Office, of course, the United Nations Peace Building Fund Secretariat, uh, that was responsible to administer the day-to-day affairs of the Peace Building Fund in Liberia. And I have also coordinated a number of peace building frameworks. Uh, recent, uh, including a stable mutual commitment that sort of was endorsed by both the government of Liberia and the United Nations Peace Building Commission that bounded the two, uh, if you like, the two parties together to ensure that uh, Liberia continue to be on the radar to ensure that uh, peace maintain, is maintained and, of course, uh, issued around conflict prevent, uh, violent conflict prevented. And of course, I am a trainer, I am a researcher, I am a facilitator, and I've worked across uh, divided parties within the sub-region. So I'm also a mediator, uh, doing mediation involving 
a number of disputes, land-related disputes in my country. Yes, that's a summary. This is what, who am I? That's just the summary. Well, Mr. Mulby, you have quite um, the experience, and I think um, it's only fitting, I guess, that we are speaking to you. Um, and so, you know, I'd like for you to take us maybe um, briefly through what the, the Liberia Peacebuilding Office does, the stakeholders that it works with, and the role that it played in the 2020 elections. Yes, uh, the Liberia Peacebuilding Office has a very crucial role and since after the war as you know our war was fought for 14 years and over 250,000 persons died and over a million persons uh, ran into refugee camps uh, so the peace building office was established in 2009 jointly by the government of the UN uh, to provide support to the government first to be able to coordinate monitor reports on peace building activities and initiatives in the country, and of course, advise the government on issue of peace building, reconciliation, uh, and then of course, to make sure that there are policies, programs that have uh, enable government to sort of uh, maintain the peace, and then mainstream, mainstream uh, conflict sensitivity across the whole of government. So that's some of the things that the peace building office does. And uh, in terms of support, uh, in terms of support, uh, the stakeholders, sorry, the stakeholders we work with, it works with a number of stakeholders. Uh, for example, it works with stakeholders at different levels, so local level, national level, international level. Uh, for example, it works with the, the African Center for Constructive, Constructive Resolution of Dispute, like Accords. All right, as one of the strategic partners, I uh, work with this institution that provided some form of capacity building in the area of uh, election dispute management. Um, so it also helped to develop the capacity of national civil society institutions. So the peace building office having such capacity and then working with the support of accord of different institutions uh, has worked with political parties uh, giving their skills, knowledge, especially when it comes to the youth and women, training their election dispute management, giving their skills and knowledge in that area. And then also work with civil society organizations across diverse fields, especially, I mean, across different uh, divided parties at different levels in the counties, uh, setting up infrastructure for peace, infrastructure for early warning and conflict prevention. Uh, I also work with government for status uh, at different levels. Uh, quite recently, you may have heard that we just concluded an election, our special senatorial election, which were relatively peaceful. We will set up situation room, a situation room on the elections, uh, and then the situation room had the opportunity to have trained and deployed over 700 volunteers uh, across the country that collected data, uh, data collected and reported incidences that had implications for electoral violence. Uh, so they will work with young people, train the young people, and then set them up across uh, different regions of the country that, will, that also engage with their peers to sort of uh, resolve issues using non-violent approach to those issues. Uh, of course, I just want to come back to the situation. The situation was structured in a way, and since it focused on elections, but it also had elements of COVID-19. Uh, so it also tried COVID-19 and see and ensure that uh, it advises, advised rather, uh, different actors, the National Election Commission, for example, the civil society too, and citizens to be able to take measures that will help them to guide against COVID-19 during the electoral process. So the election, uh, the, the national situation we do a focus on election, like I said, they also focus on COVID. So we have these two thematic areas that this national situation we're looking at. And of course, we then had a structure in a way that we have well-respected, influential personalities 
in the Liberian society. So data that were collected from, that were reported from across the entire 15 counties of Liberia, this data were then analyzed by set by, by a, a well-trained analyst and uh, they provide deep, deep in-depth analysis and then formulated recommendations. And the recommendations were now provided to these seven persons of very influential uh, persons in society that could take the phone, for example, uh, and call maybe the, election, the National Election Commissioner or call anybody in the government if there were potential conflicts in the given localities of the country that may have impl implications for violence. So, yes, yeah, so that's how we supported the election. And then, just beyond that, we were able to also facilitate uh, real time responses, uh, real time responses to uh, organizing dialogues with, for example, with potential uh, spoilers of the election, all right, for some, if they have some grievances. Organize a dialogue between the monsters to ensure that those grievances are not translated or are not escalated into any form of violence. Thank you for that. I think that was quite uh, an all-encompassing uh, and well-rounded answer. It seems um, like Liberia has done a lot of work, um, you know, in terms of early warning. Um, you spoke quite a lot about that, and I think you know you can be quite proud of the work that the Peace Building Office um, is doing. But you've raised um, a number of very interesting points that I would like to touch on. So you spoke to the genesis of the Peace Building Office and um, you know the history of Liberia and why there was even need for such um, an office in the first place. Now, I understand that it's been um, almost 20 years. I think it would be about 18 years um, since the peace agreement was signed. Um, you know, and I understand that, you know, peace building is a long-term and continuous, um, you, know, uh, you know, project that an entire nation needs to continuously work towards. So maybe could you please talk to us um, a little bit about, um, you know, the, the achievements that you think, um, you know, your country has made in terms of peace building in the last 18 years. Um, and, you know, maybe you could give us some examples of how you're able to manage, to um, rather monitor um, and evaluate, um, you know, how far along you've come in terms of your peace building work. All right, so you know, our first of all, our conflict started as far back as uh, 1989. In fact, there was a latent conflict, but it actually exploded in 1989. And of course, there were, it may like 16 conflict factors around which grievances evolved. Of those 16 conflict factors, seven of them are very strategic. In other words, if you're able to resolve one of those conflict factors, you will have resolved a number of them. So, for example, you have over centralization of governance. And so all decisions, all actions were centralized that impacted the rural part of the country. So, and because of over centralization of governance, so the issue exclusion set to end, the exclusion, exclusion of the issue exclusion, marginalization, and lack of participation, and then which gave rise to grievances or of disadvantaged people, people who felt disadvantaged. So then the war came back. So then uh, we had the, 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 after the war, then we had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the TRC. So the TRC came up with 207 recommendations. Of the 207 recommendations, you actually have like 203 that are much more doable. In other words, they are not principles, the rest are principles. So in terms of progress we made, in order to operationalize the, the TRC report or recommendations, we were able to develop what we call the strategic roadmap for national peace building, healing and reconciliation. And then we were able to translate some of those recommendations into thematic areas. Take for example, the TRC called for the launching and establishment of a national Palava Hot system. And what that means is to give opportunity for people who did not have the chance to have gone to the TRC process to be able to go to the Palava Hot. And the Palava Hot is actually a justice, a justice accountability mechanism, you know, traditional justice 
a countervailing mechanism. So now, and as part of that process, we've been able to have had four palaver halls constructed or hearings where perpetrators and victims were the interfaced and the issues that came up were resolved. Some of those issues that would not be really resolved had to be referred. Of course, the Palawan Hub will not hear issues or violations of international humanitarian law, humanitarian law, or international human rights law. Any violations related to within the confine of those two instruments were never heard under the Palawan Hub. So persecution is still an outstanding thing for Liberia, where there are many calls for criminal prosecution uh, through the establishment of war economic crimes courts. Then we have the who is your memorials. Memorial is one of the recommendations of the TRC, but then we translate that into the Roma. So we've been able to have two, I mean, three memorials now, where people who died, uh, they had to be given some dignity, some respect, and so forth and so on. And this, the support, um, actually, unfortunately, have been coming from our international partners, especially for these kind of interventions. And now you also have. Uh, holding a conference on national reconciliation. So we've been able to hold, uh, since after the war, we have had two national conferences on reconciliation. And then those two national conferences were informed by having had consultative meetings across the, the entire country at different levels. All right, so we have 15 counties, for example, that constitute the country, right? So those 15 counties, each county had to come up with their plan, what their plan for reconciliation is. Five-year plan, for example. And those five-year plan, of course, are taken or were taken to the National Conference on Reconciliation. And then they were endorsed by the government. So periodically, the government is obliged to give an account of progress reports. The last plan uh, that was endorsed by the government in 2018 it was, it was, there was a progress report that was provided by the, by the president in December of 2020. So you can see that. And then, at that conference, the recommendation of TRC have opted that there should be a national apology rendered to the people of Liberia. So at that conference, the president was able to render national apology uh, for the idle government not to have protected its citizens during the pay war. So, in addition to the strategic roadmap for national peace building as a framework, uh, we had the statement of mutual commitment, as mentioned earlier. That statement of mutual commitment was a binding instrument to ensure that Liberia remains peaceful or Liberia remains on the radar of the international community to ensure that it remains peaceful. It takes stocks of all the different elements of things that may have the potential to undermine our peace and stability. So this, uh, the United Nations Peace Building Commission, of course, endorsed that statement of mutual commitment with the government. So as, a, as an office, we were re required to do periodic reporting, annual reporting, on progress with respect to those different commitments on the side of the government that are reflected in that as the statement of mutual commitment. So that instrument is still held. Then the, the United Nations Security Council Resolution 2333 of December 2016 called for the development of a comprehensive peace building plan, all right, that would have facilitated a transition, a twin transition, let me put it that way, a transition from the democratically elected government of Mana Ellen Johnson Sirleaf to the democratic elected government of President George Weir. That transition took into account specific steps and action that should be taken to enable the transition, smooth transition. Then the second transition is transition of the United Nations mission in Liberia to that of, that may return all the security responsibility that you may UN held, trans, 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 transfer the responsibility under the new government. So the U.S. Security Council Resolution 2333 of December 2016 called for the development of a comprehensive plan. And we, on this office, were able to coordinate the development of that plan, 
alongside with the UN at the time on mill. And then in that plan, in that plan, outlined a number of areas, a number of things that should be done. For example, to have a peaceful elections, which were held, uh, I mean post-election, uh, uh, to make sure the country kept peaceful. So some of the things that should be done within the context of peace building and reconciliation. So then, we, then the, that transition, okay, that uh, plan also fell into the development of a pro quo agenda for prosperity and development, which is a five year development plan of the government. And of, of course, that plan has five or four pillars. The third pillar is sustaining the peace. And under that pillar, you have, issue, you have justice, you have defense, then you have reconciliation. So, specific to reconciliation, we're able to develop, we're able to march out or had a consultative process using a methodology called SCORE. SCORE is a social cohesion and reconciliation index. It measures the level of peace in the country, the level of social cohesion in, the, in, the, in the any given country, as opposed to a country for that matter. And we've been able to conduct the first wave of SCORE, the second wave of SCORE, the third wave of SCORE. And as a consequence of the results coming from these consultations, we've been able to actually diagnose some of the issues that require specific intervention when it comes to reconciliation, when it comes to uh, peace building and so forth. So we also have that framework that has informed the PAPD implementation. PAPD is a proper, proper uh, 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 agenda for prosperity and development, which I just mentioned. Then you also have issues around security sector reform. To the extent where you now have the, you have Justin, Justin Security Regional Hubs, they are like the front, front liners to ensure that uh, if there were any potential or potential violence or uh, anti-social behavior in a given locality, in the, you know, how the front liners will be able to contain that. The issue around rape, how to address issue, rape, identify and make sure that we have rape issues addressed, and then issues around land, because land in our country is, is a progressive land in conflict. There is a progressive conflict factor. So again, we've been able to see how we can put legislation in place. So we now have a liberal, liberal land authority, which 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 certain, which which transform or which gave which by for giving to by the liberal land commission. So that authority is now established fully to deal with land issues across the country, to deal with access to access. Uh, women access to land issue, land and, and land rights and all of that. And related to that, they will have the land right law. Then in, in addition, we have what we refer to as the Local Government Act, which is another, le form of le another legislation to ensure that you create opportunities all right, at a decentralized level so that everyone, every citizen can have equal access, equitable access to resources, to political resources, participation in governance, and all of that. So we've been doing a number of, of, of uh, we have taken a number of steps to make sure that uh, our country team is maintained and in a peaceful manner. Mr. Moba, I just want to jump in on that. So you're saying that, um, you know, from what I'm hearing, um, it sounds like, you know, it's quite a far-reaching strategy that makes use of a number of actors. Um, you know, I'd like to speak to the Women's Situation Room since you brought that up um, in your previous response. Um, you know, we know that a lot of the time women tend to be left out of, um, you know, peace-building um, you know, situations once a, a, a country has, you know, come out of um, a conflict situation and is moving into democracy. So could you maybe speak to us a little bit, um, quite briefly, um, about the women's situation? What is it? Um, you know, what exactly is its purpose? Um, and, you know, what work exactly does it engage with and who are the stakeholders? Now that uh, we have a national situation room, We've just been talking with the Women's Institution uh, funder or the country director, uh, and Ms. Uh, Councillor Chesson Ure, to see how we can have an integrated approach. All right, so have this integrated approach where the National Institution Room 
and that of the women's situation can speak to each other, can strengthen collaboration and coordination, can ensure that uh, we have uh, complementarity in our different interventions and our different approaches to, to making sure that uh, on the overall, uh, there's a prevention of electoral violence and there's opportunity to enable women's participation, the opportunity to create level playing fields for political actors, the opportunity to make sure that the citizens have access, equitable access to election guidelines, uh, they are saving voter education in place and on time. So all of these modalities or discussions uh, will soon be amplified and so that we can have that integrated and complementary sort of approach between the women's situation room and the national situation room. To our audiences at home, thank you very, very much for joining us today. We trust that you enjoyed our conversation and found it as invigorating as your cup of coffee. Until next time, this was Zoe Mafogon. Goodbye. Thank you for watching today's episode of Coffee with a Board. Do not forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can receive notifications every time we post a new episode. For more updates, like our Facebook page, African Center for the Constructive Resolution of Disputes, or follow us on Twitter or on Instagram at Accord Online. To learn more about Accord, visit our website www.accord.org.za.